We've got a bunch of injury updates, a practice recap, comments from Leslie Frazier, and a few herd mentality questions to get to. All of that's coming your way today on Locked on Bills. You are locked on Bills. Your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Tuesday slash Wednesday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, or if you are joining us on the YouTube channel, your first watch every day. As a friendly reminder, we are free and available to you on all platforms. Got a lot to get to here on the podcast today. Practice recap. Leslie Frazier made some comments in. We're going to close it out with a couple more herd mentality questions, things that I've been sitting on, and I want to start getting to them. And I think that's going to be a new standard procedure for the next couple of weeks here as camp continues. And we're not quite in the rhythm of the regular season where it's probably just easier to kind of tack on a few herd mentality questions every day, as opposed to trying to blend it together with all the news that's coming out of Buffalo Bills training camp. So as you think of tr- of herd mentality questions, keep sending them in to me. Joe at thedraftnetwork.com is my email. You can shoot me a DM on Twitter at the Joe Marino, and um, we'll start incorporating them into our podcast on a daily basis. But let's start with a practice recap from what went down on Tuesday morning at Buffalo Bills training camp. We'll start with some of the injury updates. Tim Settle and Brandon Bryant, two defensive tackles. Did not practice on Tuesday. Jake Kumaro, the Bills wide receiver, he returned to practice, and it's been a while since he was available. Tommy Doyle, the Bills offensive lineman, he was back in full, and um, that's good news because he was shaken up a bit earlier in the week, and he is back already, so that's that's encouraging. Also encouraging is that Roger Saffold, Bills guard, He is ramping up. It sounds like he's becoming more active in terms of his side work, and that's great news coming off of the rib injury from the car accident that he was in, but he's still out. Uh, The Bills were also without Ryan Bates and Greg Manns uh, at guard, and so that meant Bobby Hart and Cody Ford were the first-team guards. And, folks, if Bobby Hart and Cody Ford are the first-team guards next week when the Bills take on the Indianapolis Colts in the preseason – uh, I hope we don't see 17 on the field because that's uh, that's uh, risky. That's real risky. We'll obviously talk more about the preseason game and all that stuff next week. I'll actually be at that game uh, in Buffalo, and I'll be at practice on the 10th and 11th next week. So I'm going to have a lot of really good firsthand information to share with you from being at Bill's camp next week. Um, the Bills did have a, a bit of a scare, and we're still waiting on the severity of – this situation, and that's regarding safety Jordan Poyer. Uh, He's dealing with an elbow injury and is under further evaluation. We have no idea what the status of this. I mean, there's a wide range of possibilities. Could be a hyperextended elbow, could be fracture. Who knows? Who knows what's going on here? Uh, So we'll wait on the results of the MRI, and we'll understand what the timetable is to return. And so with Micah Hyde not doing any teamwork, right, he's still working back from that glute hip injury that he went, that he you know suffered last week. You know, he's back in pads, but he's still a bit limited in practice. Jordan Poyer had to step away. And so Jaquan Johnson and DeMar Hamlin right back out there as the starting safeties. And Hopefully everything's good with Jordan Poyer. Everything's good with Micah Hyde. We see them start every game together and and dominate like they have. But, you know, you're certainly seeing a lot of practice opportunity coming for DeMar Hamlin and Jaquan Johnson. And that really should put them in good position to help this team if their numbers are called or, you know, the Bills are up in a game and you have to kind of put these guys in maybe. You feel comfortable with all the reps that they're getting, keeping in mind that, you know, Hyde has had his own injuries right now in, in camp. And, and of course, Poyer 
at this point. But going back through the OTAs where Poyer and Hyde weren't there at all, you know, these guys have been getting a lot of run with the Bills' first team defense. And so I hope we don't have to see them on the field. But I guess the silver lining here is that those guys, Hamlin and uh, Jaquan Johnson, are getting a lot of practice reps that should prepare them well if they have to play for the Bills this season. Also leaving practice and not finishing was Marquez Stevenson, Bills' second year wide receiver. He left practice with a foot injury. All right, so with the injury updates out of the way, and unfortunately there's a lot, let's get to some of the practice recaps. John Scott commented on Tavon Austin. This is what he wrote in his recap notes. He said, Tavon Austin also flashed in one-on-ones in a variety of ways. His speed and quickness was evident as he circled to the back of the end zone for a touchdown. Later, he reeled in a beautiful beautiful fade from Josh Allen to beat Kyrie Elam. So this uh, this wide receiver situation is really interesting to me, and I think determining who's going to be the fifth, sixth, seventh guys, you know, if they keep seven, there's a lot of contenders, and Tavon Austin certainly one of them. You know, we we continue to get a lot of good feedback, whether it's practice recaps, comments from Josh Allen, comments from Sean McDermott about you know way, the way that Tavon Austin's been able to make an impact, and um, you know you, you're you're seeing in this practice recap that he's getting reps against Kyer Elam and with Josh Allen. I mean that's a first team rep, right? He's getting run with the first team offense. And so I think there's a fair amount of momentum here that we should acknowledge for Tavon Austin as a roster candidate, especially because he does something that I don't think people are giving enough attention to, and that's providing depth on the outside. He's played a lot of outside receiver in the NFL. And so as the Bills have come out and admitted that they're deeper in the slot, Factoring in a guy like Tavon Austin, who brings speed, who brings return ability, but also has played outside receiver in the NFL, there's there's a lot going for Tavon Austin when it comes to his chances of, of making this roster, in my opinion. John Scott also had some really positive remarks for Isaiah Hodgins. Uh, Bills, I think it's his third year wide receiver, right? A, a late round pick out of Oregon State. Um, injuries his first year, practice squad guy last year. And uh, it's good to hear, right? The, the, the good thing about Isaiah Hodgins is that he brings a different skill set to the table, kind of a long, lean frame, you know, a, a catch radius guy, a bigger uh, framed player, even though he is kind of lean, gives you some height and some wingspan at receiver. And you go back to Oregon State, you I mean, the, the route running the hands was pretty evident. You know, it was the questions with, with Hodgins were, you know, can he beat press coverage? Can he handle physicality as a route runner? Uh, can he be more than just a big slot? Can he play on the outside? A lot of questions there, but you know, we 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 have learned recently that he spent the offseason working with Gabriel Davis. And all we've heard about Gabriel Davis this offseason is that he's working his ass off, not taking any time off, and really preparing himself to meet this opportunity where he's going to gain a lot more market share in this offense. Well, right alongside him has been Gabriel, uh, has been Isaiah Hodgins. And so I think preseason will be big for Isaiah Hodgins. I think uh, injuries for the players ahead of him on the depth chart will will be important. But uh, it's it's nice to hear that Isaiah Hodgins has performed well. And you know we heard this last year, right? Uh, early in camp, and especially in OTAs. Now it's about following through and being consistent, improving yourself uh, when these preseason games come around. We heard more positivity for Christian Benford, and this is this is a little bit of a trend here. A lot of positivity for the Bills' six-round pick out of Villanova. John Scott mentioned a pass breakup covering Isaiah McKenzie, a pass breakup covering Stephon Diggs. And so the Bills have a lot of intriguing young corners that are very unproven. And this is a, a big challenge ahead for Sean McDermott, Leslie Frazier, John Butler to identify what they have and make sure they keep the right ones. Because whether it's been Nick McLeod or Christian Benford or Cam Lewis, of course, Dane Jackson and Kyrie Elam, Saran Neal, it feels like there's just a lot of good stuff being said about these young corners. Good problem to have. We'll see how it all sorts itself out this preseason. One of my favorite takeaways that we we seem to continue get getting 
and, and we got good reports today from John Scott and Sal Capaccio about Terrell Bernard and, and how he's looking in coverage. This is what Sal Capaccio said about Terrell Bernard in his rookie in his recap article. He said, Terrell Bernard has really impressed me with his coverage skills all camp long. On the first day, he made a great play to break up a pass at the goal line for tight end Dawson Knox. He did the same on Tuesday and more in open space. Bernard was known for his coverage skills when he was drafted by the Bills out of Baylor. He's definitely lived up to that part of his game here at St. John Fisher University. I'll tell you what. I am uh, I'm really intrigued by this linebacker trio of Tremaine Edmonds, Matt Milano, Terrell Bernard. From a matchup perspective with what you can do coverage-wise with those players is really interesting. We know what Matt Milano can do in coverage. He's proven himself in the NFL. A very good high-end matchup linebacker that can play man coverage, play zone, and just gives you a lot in space and on passing downs. We know Tremaine Edmonds has a lot of size and range and length and wingspan to really influence coverage windows in the middle of the field. And, and certainly a lot you can do with him from a coverage perspective. Now you add Terrell Bernard into this, and you really have three guys that can hold their own in space and and pedal and, and move laterally and, and cover. And whether it's zone or man, they have the skill sets to be good players. And I just feel like that opens up so much for this scheme. You know, obviously, Taron Johnson's a huge part of what the Bills do. But you have some some really unique ability here to use Terrell Bernard in the overhang, to use Milano as a matchup guy, to have Edmonds in the middle of the field, and really adjust the way you can space the field. You can use those guys with a lot of confidence in their coverage range and their coverage instincts to take away certain areas of the field and maybe be more aggressive in other areas. And it really just kind of can change the math for how you can space the field from a coverage perspective. And so we just keep getting good reports on Terrell Bernard and coverage. And, you know, that should be the expectation. That's what he did well in, in, in college at Baylor playing in a very wide open conference, uh, the big 12, where it's a lot of spacing and there's a lot on you as a linebacker from a spacing perspective and what you're responsible for and what you have to deal with. And he's obviously got a ton of athleticism. And so I, I'm really encouraged for, Terrell Bernard, but also what he can mean for the evolution of the Buffalo Bills defensive scheme. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life is full of twists and turns, and it's important to show up for yourself through it all. BetterHelp Online Therapy will assess your needs and can match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. We've all had situations in life where we need someone to talk to, and I encourage everyone to be open to therapy. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online, available to people worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to be on camera if you don't want to. And getting therapy every week is as easy as a few clicks on your laptop or phone. There's so many great reviews with BetterHelp. Uh, just this week, a BetterHelp user who's had issues concerning stress anxiety, depression, self-esteem, trauma, and abuse, and ADHD said this about one of the therapists at BetterHelp, Willie Whited. He said he's an excellent listener, provides sound counsel, and is a wonderful sounding board. I appreciate someone helping me understand how I feel and in developing healthy coping strategies. And they have a special offer for my listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on. That's 10% off your first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash locked on. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the comments made by Leslie Frazier, Bill's defensive coordinator and assistant head coach. I don't think we talk enough about Leslie Frazier also having that label. And what does that mean? It's interesting to me. What, what does what does Leslie Frazier's title as assistant head coach actually mean for what he does beyond being a typical defensive coordinator? I'd be interested in knowing that. But he, he talked about a lot of these players that we've kind of mentioned already this week on the podcast. And it's always kind of good to layer together the, what the coaches say about these players and 
you know, what they're doing on the field. So let's start with Ed Oliver and the comments that Leslie Frazier made about Ed Oliver. He said he's seeing the maturation from an intellectual standpoint. Early on, Ed was relying so much on his physical ability, trying to outpower people. He's learned at this level, the neck up matters. He's understanding situational football. That's where the growth has been. And he attributes a lot of that to Eric Washington's coaching. Frazier said Ed Oliver's game took off last season and that they're looking forward to more of that in 2022. I think it's a good, good commentary from Coach Frazier where you think about this guy at Houston, a big-time five-star recruit. He's going to be able to out-athlete and out-power those blockers in the AAC. And that's good, but to beat offensive linemen in the NFL, it requires more than just being fast and powerful. And that's a good thing for us to acknowledge and maybe help us understand better why maybe there was some inconsistency with that Oliver outside of structural issues with the Bills defense, but also why we've seen him come on. And, um, Obviously, very excited for where Ed's at, how he's performing at camp. We we spent a lot of time on Ed Oliver yesterday, but it was cool to hear Coach Frazier talk about that mental side of of the game coming clearer for Ed and how that can continue to help him grow as a player. And obviously, pairing with Von Miller should open up a lot of one-on-one chances for Ed Oliver. Regarding Christian Benford, Leslie Frazier, he said, During the draft process, he may have been overlooked. They were excited to draft him. Said he's another one of those young corners with maturity, playmaking ability, and instincts that get you excited. We're looking forward to seeing his progression. He has a maturity that you like to see. Positive remarks there from from Coach Frazier regarding a player that I I think earlier this offseason, you know, between the draft and now, I, I wondered if there would be a spot for him on this roster. Well, it sounds like he's really kind of forcing the issue, and I'm very excited to see Christian Benford in the preseason games. Regarding Saran Neal, Wesley Frazier said, he's grown so much since his rookie season. He's grown as a defensive back and not just special teams. They're doing some things right now defensively to highlight some of his strengths, which includes man coverage ability and awareness to the scheme. Frazier called Saran Neal a tremendous athlete, and he's developing a true understanding of what it means to be a good defensive back. We'll see. We'll see if the Bills are going to – they certainly have a lot of options, right, with, with Bernard, with Taron Johnson, with Saran Neal, with all these different defensive backs and back seven players in general. They can do a lot. What does it look like, right? What does it look like? And I, I, you know, I talked a little bit about Saran Neal yesterday and just how there was that point in time coming – out of the 2019 season where I thought, well, look, I think this guy has a real chance to claim a role in this defense. And then, you know, it, it really didn't happen. And he really emerged on special teams. And so I'm not going to like fully go all in on the idea of Saran Neal and maybe him being a, a 20% of the time player for the defense, but he's a player that's intrigued me ever since the first time I watched him at Jacksonville state and in watching that tape and seeing him at the senior bowl in mobile, uh, you know, really interesting evolution as a player. And, Really curious to see how the Bills deploy him this year. Regarding Kyer Elam, Leslie Frazier said he's wise beyond his years, and a lot of that comes from his background with a father and uncle who played the game. He's encouraged with his growth when it comes to coverage and trusting where his help is going to be in playing to his leverage. It's something you hope to see with everyone, and we're seeing that with Kyer Elam. You know, that's that's interesting because contrasting Kyer Elam at Florida and playing a lot of press man coverage and not having a lot of help to now going to a scheme that I think wants to play more press man coverage, but at its core is going to be a leverage based zone defense hearing Kyer Elam and and Leslie Frazier speaking specifically to trusting technique, trusting leverage, trusting where your help's going to come from kind of speaks to some of that acclimation that Kyer Elam needed uh, to undergo considering what he was asked to do at the college level and how different the Bills play defense from a coverage perspective. So I'm really interested to see how the impact comes for Kyer Elam and 
you know, I, I keep going back to this. When Trey White's healthy, who's CB2? Is it Dane Jackson, who has got some experience and has flashed? Or is it Kyrie Elam, who's your first-round pick? Well, we know eventually it's Kyrie Elam, but if that's the case, well, what's the plan for Dane Jackson, right? I, there's there's layers to this that fascinate me to see how this all play out. And, and surely if Trey White's not available early on and you see Kyrie Elam and Dane Jackson on the field, when Trey's ready to go, you'll you'll know, right? Because we'll have a sample size of Elam and Jackson playing this year, and the best one will be the starter opposite of Trey White. But I'm really, really fascinated to see this all play out. Lastly, from Coach Frazier, he commented on Nick McLeod and said he's been a pleasant surprise to this point, playing safety and corner, has handled it well physically and mentally, and how he handles the physicality of the safety position is important. So file that away when you're watching Bill's preseason games this year and Nick McLeod's on the field, see how he tackles, see how he plays through contact, see if he's physical with tight ends at the safety position at the top of routes, all that type of stuff. Because Leslie Frazier told you the physicality that he plays with at at safety is going to be important. Well, let's make sure we evaluate that when we get to the preseason games. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, eSports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening now. BetOnline. It's where the game starts. All right, let's get to some herd mentality questions here to close things out. First one comes from Scarecrow, also one sent in by Don, uh, and it's regarding Tevin Jenkins. And this is from Scarecrow. He says, the Bears are apparently shopping Tevin Jenkins in a trade just one year after drafting him in the second round. I know you were a big fan of him coming out, so I'm wondering if you'd want the Bills to be in on acquiring him if there is a spot on the roster for him. Yeah, I love Tevin Jenkins uh, coming out of Oklahoma State. Just watch him play at Oklahoma State. You'll love him too. He, he's he's an ass kicker. Dude gets after people. He's a mauler. And um, I was very excited for him in the NFL. Now, his rookie season was a struggle. He had a back injury that sidelined him for a lot of it. And that's difficult, right? We talk about guys coming out of their final season in college going through the draft process, getting drafted. You know, there's a lot that goes into that, and especially when you're dealing with a back injury and you're an offensive lineman. So it didn't go well, but obviously it it, it still isn't going well, where he's not even really getting opportunities in practice, and there's questions about his attitude and all that type of stuff. So there's layers to this, but I certainly love the player I watch at Oklahoma State. Never met him, so I don't really know what he's like as a human. And if he's got the right DNA and he's wired the right way, but you know, if the Bears are going to give him away, right? And we're talking about a guy that they drafted in the second round, but not not by Ryan Poles, their current GM. This was the last GM, Ryan Pace. Ryan Poles don't care about players Ryan Pace drafted. You know, we we see this every year when there's turnover with leadership. Guys want their own guys. So if Tevin Jenkins is available and they're going to give him away, heck yeah, I want in on that. And if he flops, he flops. The player I saw at Oklahoma State was a guy that I thought could be an impact starter in the NFL. So go ahead and get him into your program and see what he is, especially at a low cost. I'm in on that all the way. Spencer says, how normal is it in the NFL for offensive lines to be rotating so many different players? It seems like for the past three years, the Bills offensive lines, toughest opponent has been their own health from 2020, where you kept hammering home that they never took a snap with all five starting offensive linemen, to 2021, where they couldn't get it settled until the second Patriots game only because of injury, to now in 2022, where as of the fifth practice, the Bills only had one starting lineman available. It's been crazy how little time together these guys have spent, and I'm curious if this is just the norm across the league or if we are just lucky. It certainly feels like the Bills have had more inconsistency with the players available on the offensive line than a lot of teams. Now, I I certainly recognize that there's been a lot of teams out there that have had offensive line injuries, and you know the Bills have have certainly been one of them. But 
I find myself frustrated by this, and, and I appreciate you kind of reminding me of things that I've said over the last three years about just getting the right guys together and allowing them to gel and play ball together. feels like the Bills just can't get this opportunity. And it's not because I think they've not had good personnel and that type of stuff, but it's like at some point, you know, you want to be that team that had all five of your starters together for all 16 or whatever, 17 games. And the Bills haven't been able to do that. And I, I want that badly because I know how important that is for them to perform at their best. I know how important it is for the Bills to protect Josh Allen. And I've, I'm extremely excited for the personnel that they have. I've said that this is the best group that Brandon Bean's assembled in front of Josh Allen from a, a you know roster perspective at offensive line. And I certainly love Aaron Cromer and, and the impact that he can have on this group. But my goodness, can he have the starters? That'd be great. Contrasting it to the rest of the league, you know, I'm certainly mostly dialed in on the Bills, but I, I feel like it's been a little more than than usual for the Bills here over the last several years, and I was hopeful that that would stop this year. But here we are, a week into training camp, and <laughs> the offensive line's different every day. Next one comes from Tim. Tim says, my question is about A.J. Epinesa. What are you seeing that leads to his inconsistencies? Being from Iowa, I watched him play, and I thought he would be more impactful for the Bills. The hype Dawkins gave him last year in training camp and his start to the season was impressive. What in the heck happened to his trajectory? Yeah, I think there's a lot to get into with A.J. Epinesa, right? And certainly a very high-impact player at Iowa. And I, I'm I'm happy that you asked this question understanding the player that he was at Iowa, a really good player. You know, I, I still think that he was a guy that had his – had work needed in terms of his recognition skills with blocks, especially against the run. I didn't think he processed that well. But when you watched him rush at Iowa, you saw him use that length and that power to really reduce rush angles and compromise the width of the pocket as a compression-style rusher. And so that's important for us to know because he underwent that body transformation as a rookie where he dropped like 20 or 30 pounds. And so when you're a power compression style rusher and all of a sudden you drop 20 30 pounds that's different right you might be a little quicker but maybe you don't have that same mass when working to power through those rush angles and so we we kind of said okay well it's your rookie season you went underwent a body transformation and you had to kind of relearn how you win but you say okay all right well we want to see you in year two and then like you mentioned year two you get the hype train from Deion Dawkins you have the the game against Miami early in the season and then that's it. And you heard Coach Frazier talk about this recently where he thought it was a lot of confidence, right, in, in you know dealing with maybe not being where you want to be as a player and where you envision yourself to be as a player, and you're relearning the position at a new weight and with a new skill set, and how you won at Iowa is not the same anymore, right, because you have a different body. And I think there's just a lot of layers to this, including the overall confidence. So big year for AJ Epinesa. We all know that. But I think I think what it comes back down to is is the confidence, but also relearning how to use his skill set, right? Because I think his skill set has shifted a lot from Iowa to now. And I think we need to be mindful of of that shift. I really do. Last one comes from Charlie, who says, just wanted to hear your thoughts on the Madden ratings. Our Bills players received, in my opinion, Josh deserves to be way more than a 92, which was fourth. His throw under pressure was a 91 when, when he is literally the best quarterback under pressure. I do love the fact that both of our safeties got the respect they deserve, but both ranking within the top eight. Let me know what you think and go Bills. So I didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, reviewing the Madden ratings. I, I haven't owned Madden since Peyton Hillis was on the cover with the Cleveland Browns. I played Madden, I think I played at the Super Bowl. I was in I was in LA for the Super Bowl. Uh and I played a a one-on-one -on -one game against uh Kyle Krabs and I actually played with the Bills and I threw five interceptions with Josh Allen. So my Madden skills are really really rusty cuz I I've really kind of been out of it for a long long time. I don't even have like a a current game system to play. Um so I don't get too caught up on the Madden things. But I'll say two things about the Bills and the Madden ratings. First of all, a 92 for Josh Allen. I feel like, because I will say that when I did play Madden for all the years 
up to that Peyton Hills cover, whenever year that was. I was dialed in. I loved it. Franchise mode. I played all the time. It feels like Josh Allen's the ultimate Madden quarterback, right? The ultimate one. Big, physical, can run, can throw, all, all the things you would want. And so I would anticipate, I guess, him being a little higher up. I mean, fourth best quarterback, whatever, I can live with that, but maybe 95, 96 would be a little bit more in line with what I think Josh Allen offers from a video game perspective. But I thought the most offensive and egregious rating was Tyler Bass. Like, I think Tyler Bass is one of the better kickers in the game and is a great video game kicker as well. So, what do you, how, how was he like a somewhere in the 70s? Was he even in the top 10 kickers? I think that's where I get the most offended when it comes to the Bills. Madden ratings. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. Bills are back on the practice field on Wednesday. We'll uh, respond to all the things that we learned. Don't be afraid to send in some herd mentality questions that I can kind of weave in uh, tomorrow and, and even throughout the course of the of the coming weeks here. Obviously, I can't wait to be at camp next week, and I can't wait for you to come back tomorrow. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.